History as it happens, February 10th, 2022. Invisible carnage. I am now convinced that as many as 10 civilians, including up to seven children, were tragically killed in that. It's very difficult for us, for the people of Afghanistan, to find answer why civilian people are dying. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. We also struck a chemical weapons related facility in Sudan. Our target was the terrorists' base of operation. We regret any, even one, Afghan civilian casualty, innocent civilian casualty. As the United States has waged its war on terrorism, thousands of civilians have been slaughtered in errant airstrikes and mistaken attacks in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. This gruesome reality of the American way of war is now receiving fresh scrutiny in the form of a Defense Department investigation. But public indifference to the deaths of others goes back decades. Let's try to understand why next, as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. They include a little girl, 11 years old, in a new purple dress sitting down to dinner with her family, a wife as she slept next to her husband, a young boy playing soccer. I think that the indifference comes from not wanting to deal with the actual consequences of U.S. actions. That is, there is a pattern of public reaction to these wars. Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois said something quite telling about the issue we're going to discuss here as he opened a hearing on the use of drones in the war on terrorism. In April of 2013, I held the Senate's first and to date the only hearing on the nation's use of drone strikes to lethally target suspected terrorists overseas. One hearing in a decade. And that's despite the fact the U.S. has launched thousands of missiles and conducted countless raids in nations Congress never declared war against. At the time, I was troubled by stories of innocent people being killed by these strikes, as well as the potential for these strikes to violate the law and undermine our national security with very little transparency and accountability. In the nine years since that 2013 hearing, the watchdog group Air Warriors estimates that as many as 10,000 to 30,000 more civilians have been killed by U.S. coalition strikes. The consequences of these military actions receive sporadic attention, sometimes when a terrorist leader is killed and sometimes when civilians are blown to pieces, as was the case during the chaotic pullout in Afghanistan after suicide bombers killed U.S. Marines at Kabul airport. President Biden promised retaliation. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. The retaliatory airstrike that was supposed to take out ISIS-K operatives killed ordinary people instead. Moreover, we now assess that it is unlikely that the vehicle and those who died were associated with ISIS-K or were a direct threat to U.S. forces. I offer my profound condolences to the family and friends of those who were killed. And that's General Kenneth McKenzie, who is in charge of CENTCOM. So now Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin wants the military to do more to protect civilians. I know personally how hard we work to avoid civilian harm and to abide by the law of armed conflict. But I've also said that we need to do better, and we will. He's ordering the Pentagon to deal with systemic weaknesses identified in a report requested by Congress from the RAND Corporation, as well as eye-opening problems identified in brilliant investigative journalism by the New York Times. It revealed how the Pentagon covered up errant airstrikes that wiped out, in some cases, dozens of innocent people. The Geneva Conventions, the law of armed conflict embraced by the Pentagon, they simply get lost in the fog of war when human beings make snap decisions to incinerate someone they believe is a terrorist. So this may be a rare moment of self-evaluation in the American way of war. We'll see how long it lasts, because we know from our history the deaths of others have been met mostly with indifference by the U.S. public, and not just now or since 9-11. People began to feel like this was just a mess, and they wanted to turn away from it. They wanted to turn away from the complexity of it, from the bloodshed, 
Historian John Tierman, author of the 2011 book, The Deaths of Others, will join us in a moment. This problem has gotten attention over the years, but it quickly fades. I'm sure you remember the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, perpetrated by al-Qaeda. President Clinton ordered retaliation. The United States launched an attack this morning on one of the most active terrorist bases in the world. It is located in Afghanistan and operated by groups affiliated with Osama bin Laden, a network not sponsored by any state, but as dangerous as any we face. We also struck a chemical weapons related facility in Sudan. Our target was the terrorists' base of operation and infrastructure. So that terrorist installation in Sudan turned out to be a medicine factory. The Sudanese have not forgotten, even if many of us have. Before the advent of precision bombing or precision airstrikes as a way to avoid large-scale U.S. casualties, the United States once carpet-bombed other nations with devastating effect in World War II and then in Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia. The number of civilians killed in all these wars, in some cases burned alive by napalm, is somewhere in the hundreds of thousands, talking about people killed directly by U.S. bombing. Seldom did it provoke outrage among American citizens. In Afghanistan, although ordinary people there despised many aspects of the Taliban, they turned against the American occupation because airstrikes killed so many of their relatives and neighbors, a fact often ignored in the mainstream discourse about the disastrous end to that disastrous war. Historian John Tierman is the executive director of MIT Center for International Studies and is the author of the aforementioned The Deaths of Others, The Fate of Civilians in America's Wars. John Tierman, welcome. Thank you. So you argued in your 2011 book that Americans are indifferent to the massive human tragedies that take place in our wars, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq. Why did you believe that was the case. Is that still the case? Well, I was struck uh, at the beginning of the Iraq war in 2003 with the fact that there was very little reporting about what was happening to Iraqi civilians. And, you know, there was this great supposed victory in taking Baghdad in a few days, a little pushback from insurgents, but mainly a kind of a victory march to Baghdad. And there were intimations that there were large-scale casualties, but the mainstream news media did not really try to find out what was going on on the ground with civilians. So this interested me. And then The Lancet, the British medical journal, published an article by Les Roberts and others at the Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health that said that 100,000 Iraqis had been killed in the first 18 months of the war, including fighters and civilians. And this was a controversial number, and this led me to look at it more closely. The fact that there was so much pushback on the idea that 100,000 Iraqis could have been killed in 18 months, which is a fairly long time for an intensive war, struck me as being evidence that we weren't really interested in what was happening to civilians. And so this prompted me to look back on the war in Vietnam, the war in Korea, and finally to write this book. And I found this pattern of indifference to the local populations, uh, which I think manifested in different ways each time. For the most part, it does seem the American citizenry is not up on these things, or we find ways to justify it when we hear about it. I mean, the war in Iraq, to use that case again, was seen by many as a war of retribution in a way because of what happened on 9-11, even though we know Saddam Hussein and Iraq had nothing to do with the al-Qaeda strikes. Right. I think that the indifference comes from not wanting to deal with the actual consequences of U.S. actions. That is, there is a pattern of public reaction to these wars excluding World War II and World War I, which were very different in scale and very different in purpose. In Korea, in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, it followed a pattern of first great enthusiasm about the U.S. intervention, believing that we were there for good reasons, 
turn back communism, to get bin Laden, to get, uh, as you say, retribution in Iraq, turn back and defeat Saddam Hussein. There was a lot of enthusiasm for this, but it dissipated rather quickly, even more so in the more recent wars, as things began to go awry militarily. That is, that we weren't winning an outright victory. It was not like World War II. There were a lot of setbacks or a lot of casualties on the American side. People began to feel like this was just a mess, and they wanted to turn away from it. They wanted to turn away from the complexity of it, from the bloodshed, and the responsibility for the destructiveness of these wars. So I think that's the origin of the indifference, is just simply not wanting to engage with the consequences of war. Americans are probably like people in other countries, insofar we care more about our own war dead than the people we're killing, especially if those people have been dehumanized through propaganda or just seen as, well, as we say, collateral damage, right? Language plays a role here, doesn't it? We tend to view the people of East Asia, where we had wars, and the Middle East, where we've had these wars, as savages. Savages in the same way that we viewed the First Nations people on this continent as we pushed across the continent for, you know, 300 plus years. There's a very similar kind of dynamic going on here. We viewed the tribes, the indigenous tribes here as expendable, basically, in our push across the continent. That push across the continent was also justified by a kind of Christian or pseudo-Christian ethos about bringing civilization to these areas and so on. But we definitely looked at it as a wilderness to be tamed. And that is how we looked at Vietnam and Korea, Iraq and Afghanistan. The wilderness is uncivilized, dangerous, but with a bounty, with something rewarding at the end of the rainbow. And the local people were simply expendable along the way. So there was a certain amount of racism involved. There was a certain amount of missionary zeal involved. There was a certain amount of privilege. I think this is where the whole idea of American exceptionalism comes in, a sense of privilege in that we were better than they were, more civilized. And that can justify a lot of horrible things. And today, with our massive military and extraordinary technology, the ability to wage war anywhere on the planet, uh, there's something else at work here. Viewing our enemies and their actions as so despicable, i.e. 9-11, that it justifies almost anything on our part to, say, win a war for our own defense. And because the U.S. military does not deliberately, as a matter of policy, target civilians in a way that kind of allows or creates this permissive atmosphere that there will be accidental civilian deaths. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, well, this is an area of controversy, even among people who study this closely, and that is, to what extent does the U.S. military actually try to prevent civilian harm? The military will say, and has said for some years, that they take every precaution they can, including getting approval up the chain of command for airstrikes that may involve civilians. This is true up to a point, but the problem is that in the actual conduct of operations on the ground, a lot of the legalities get shunted aside. That is, when a squad is doing a a sweep of a village, They're knocking on doors, breaking doors down, assaulting, if not physically assaulting, verbally assaulting women in areas in which this is a very sensitive matter. Iraq. Iraq particularly, but also Afghanistan. Challenging and threatening young men because young men tend to be the enemy in the eyes of the U.S. soldiers. All of this adds up to a lot of abuse. It's not always resulting in death. But it is a lot of abuse. And what happens is that these people, especially the young men who may be idle otherwise, will tend to join militia to defend their, in their view, defend their communities. 
So it becomes a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the U.S. military trying to pacify an area actually stimulates through its actions a more resistance, more violent resistance and more killing because these are considered terrorists and they don't even need legal justification for attacking them if they feel, if the U.S. soldiers feel that they're under some danger. You know, who's a civilian, who's not a civilian? Where is the threat? Is the threat one that needs to be justified by legal advice and so on? But the fact is that just a lot of people are being killed. Some of it by airstrikes, some of it by artillery, some of it in firefights. A lot of people are being killed who are either civilians or believe that they are simply defending their communities. As the New York Times has reported in its brilliant series of investigative reports, the reporters visited sites in Iraq and Syria where there had been airstrikes. Misidentification was a huge factor in killing civilians. But again, as you mentioned, what is written on paper in the Geneva Accords and then what happens in the fog of war when we're fighting in countries where the enemy, whoever that might be, is mixed with civilians because we're in towns, we're in cities, we're in villages. Yeah, well, the the training is inadequate. This I know from looking at it fairly closely. A lot of soldiers and Marines don't really study the Geneva Accords. There's very little training given on the Geneva Accords, and, and they tend to diss it anyway. It's not for soldiers, you know, it's for lawyers. And this, I think, results in attitudes towards civilians that are very hostile. I mean, there's an assumption, and we've seen this in surveys among the troops, there's a, an assumption that most civilians are anti-American, if not even considered terrorists or fighters. So you have these attitudes that are very hard to dislodge. The New York Times pieces that you mentioned, mainly the work of Asmat Khan, who's a journalist, American journalist, working with others, Anand Gopal particularly. It was a remarkable piece of journalism, I must say. Very brave to go into these places. They found that the military had underestimated the casualties of mortality in Mosul by 31 times. The death toll in Mosul from U.S. airstrikes was 31 times greater than what the U.S. military was saying. Now, some of this is ignorance. Some of it is poor methods of intelligence gathering. And some of it, I'm sorry to say, it's just plain dishonesty. That's right. It's deliberate, a deliberate cover-up in some cases. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen this in the military time and time again, going back to the Korean War, to My Lai in Vietnam, uh, Haditha in Iraq, which is much smaller compared with My Lai, but still the initial response of the U.S. military, whatever branch, is to minimize the U.S. role in mortality, if not give a completely false story about what happened. And this is, this is something that needs to be looked at more closely. One of the more trenchant observations in your book about the Iraq War was among the explanations for why the insurgency picked up speed so quickly and ferociously opposed the U.S. occupation wasn't, say, the Sunnis had lost their livelihoods, mass unemployment. It was because the United States was killing so many people. Yeah, I think if you look at the way operations were conducted, and we do have after-action reports that come from the military itself, uh, so it's not dependent on journalists or others who may or may not be in these places, right? I mean, they're not Journalists can't be everywhere, and they tended to be back that century. A lot of killing took place in the countryside in the smaller towns and villages. And what happened in these cases very significantly were that the local people, which have these very strong and extensive kinship networks, would be called to arms, essentially, by the local mosque others who were operating with al-Qaeda and other jihadi groups or just the tribal chieftains, uh, not necessarily jihadists, but just tribal chieftains in the countryside, they would call people to arms to defend their communities. This was, I think, the resistance 
in Iraq. And it was so difficult to get a handle on from a military standpoint because there was no one organization that was was organizing this resistance. It was hundreds of families and tribal chiefs and a few, you know, really bad actors that were organizing the resistance. And it was very pluralistic. It was very widespread. It was here and there. It was in the mosque. It was in the marketplace. It created a resistance that the United States really never got a, a handle on and indeed stimulated the rise of ISIS later on, which is still in existence. Yes. So you can see that the the killing itself was at the root cause of the failure of the mission. And as you pointed out in a foreign affairs article you wrote a few years ago, among the many reasons for the record of poor outcomes when it comes to the U.S. war making is the failure to account for the human costs of war. These interventions lead to more interventions, lead to more interventions, as you just mentioned, went from fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq to creating a situation with ISIS and so on. To my earlier point, who's an enemy in these situations? Well, someone could be a citizen or a civilian on Tuesday, and then they're enraged by what's going on around them, and they're suddenly picking up a gun on Thursday, and they're considered the enemy. I want to just go back to my earlier point, my initial point about the causes of indifference. We know that the U.S. military does not report civilian casualties accurately. The U.S. news media doesn't do a great job of it either, at least the mainstream press. It's not that there's no coverage. It's just not consistent enough. You know, imagine how our mentalities might change if we saw these things in the news or in our social media feeds consistently. If we saw photos of civilian casualties. The Cost of War Project at Brown University has made a recommendation that the news media should always, to the extent possible, include civilian casualty data in its war reporting. What do you think of that? Well, I think it needs a much broader discussion, clearly. What the responsibility of the news media is, is really up to the news media. The fact is that Americans are not really informed about what's going on in these wars. Not deeply informed. Yes, there are some very brave journalists out there for the major news outlets that do as much as they can, I think, to report accurately what's going on. But they are dependent on the military to some extent. They're dependent on other sources that have biases of various kinds. The health ministry in Iraq, for example, has been under the control of Muqtada al-Sadr for several years. And so you want some statistics about what's going on in the country that they may be gathering, well, it's biased and uh, it's very hard to get that information. So I don't blame the journalists too much about how they're reporting, although there have been, of course, some failures. What we really need, I think, is a government agency, not the military, something like the Government Accountability Office. Or Congress can step in. Well, Congress could Congress could yeah. authorize this, but yeah. Congress is so divided now and, and so partisan, it's hard to imagine them doing the right work on this. Yeah, their jobs. You, know, you need a bland bunch of bureaucrats, really, many of whom, like in the Congressional Research Service, do a very good job of researching controversial issues to set up a mechanism which would include household surveys in the war zones when it's not too unsafe, as satellite photography, other means of gathering information, crowdsourcing, interviews, and try to get a better sense of what the human costs of war are on a real-time basis. You know, So you have a report every six months or so. I think this is our responsibility to do. You know, Here we are in foreign lands, often not authorized by Congress, not authorized by the UN, not with a real genuine purpose, you know, a legitimate purpose to be there, and causing havoc that is affecting generations of local people. The trouble in Syria is, for example, a result of the war in Iraq. And I'm glad you made that point about the news media because we, we should note, or I should note as a journalist myself, how dangerous and difficult that kind of reporting really is. And again, the New York Times series on civilian casualties and U.S. airstrikes is brilliant reporting. I also sense that this is not unique to Americans, that people in general, 
war is messy, so this stuff is going to happen, right? Oh, well, it's regrettable, but I mean, I don't agree with that attitude, but I think it does play a part here. It raises a deeper question. What are we doing in these places to begin with? Why are we chasing around lightly armed militants in the name of national security? Right. Well, the war in, in Afghanistan was understandable given the hot pursuit of bin Laden, that the United States then did not execute the mission as efficiently as it could have is a, you know, is a matter of controversy and discussion. 20 years there was uh, obviously a failure in and of itself. So, but the original impetus for going into Afghanistan, I think, was at least plausible. The war in Iraq, many of us had warned against the war in Iraq before it started, the war in Iraq beginning in March of 2003. And it's clear in retrospect, in fact, it was clear rather quickly that the justification for the war was phony. Now, that is something that should be prosecuted, frankly. We shouldn't allow the leaders of our country, elected leaders, who should be responsible for these actions, get away with them if, if they have done it under false pretenses. Yeah, and it's clear that the Bush administration was lying about the WMDs. Look at the havoc that has been the result of that deception. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I'm with you. The war in Iraq was a crime. The war that was in, a crime. The war, yeah. the war in Vietnam was a crime against the people of that country, not just committed by the U.S., but also, as Max Hastings recently pointed out in his volume about that war, you know, the North Vietnamese were also cruel in, in the way they prosecuted that war, not to digress. But actually, I I do want to ask you about some of these earlier conflicts. Uh, During World War II, the U.S. and especially the United Kingdom took part in what was called area bombing or carpet bombing. Weapons were not, quote unquote, precise in those days. And of course, World War II ends with the atomic bombs. But carpet bombing continues in North Korea during the Korean War, does it not? Was there any public pushback about what was going on there? No, I don't think there was, and uh, nothing significant. They called it strategic bombing, and in some cases, they actually called it terror bombing. And in fact, one of the FDR meetings with Churchill, I think they explicitly talked about terror bombing in Germany. Uh, and there were 60-plus cities that were bombed with napalm, firebombing, in Germany, and about the same number in Japan. Tokyo was firebombed 180,000 with 180,000 deaths in Tokyo. This is before the atomic bomb. A lot of bombing of Japanese cities. People were driven out of the countryside. There was starvation. Same in Korea, no use of the atomic bomb. But as General LeMay bragged at the time, he was the head of the Air Force, that they would not leave any building standing in North Korea, and that promise was virtually fulfilled. Do we have any idea how many people in Korea died as a result of all this bombing? Well, there aren't very good methods used to estimate these things because you really have to do it more or less contemporaneously. But the estimates I've seen, and I've looked at this pretty closely, between three and four million altogether in Korea, north and south, a very densely populated country. It was a very bloody war. It wasn't just the aerial bombing. It was on the ground operations as well. A massive a conventional war. warfare. Yeah, it was huge. But Americans turned away from Korea very quickly because it went, it went sour. After MacArthur's remarkable landing at Incheon, they moved right to the Chinese border in a matter of a few months and then got turned back. And it was when it got turned back and we started to lose the war, or at least play for a tie, so to speak, the American public really turned off to this. And there was nothing, none of the sympathy for Korean refugees and Korean orphans and so on, as there had been in Europe uh, during World War II. Would you say the Vietnam War was the exception to this, where Americans were largely indifferent to civilian casualties, But in Vietnam, there was an awareness among the anti-war left that the U.S., this powerful country, was bombing the living daylights out of a a tiny peasant nation. There was more awareness, it's true, 
And I think it was due to the anti-war movement, some of whom were former soldiers, some of whom were clergy, wasn't just, you know, the fringe elements and hippies and whatnot, but people with a lot of credibility. But the the fact is that there was still a lot of indifference. I mean, if you look at surveys at the time, the concern continued to be about American casualties in Vietnam. This is what the anti-war left often argued. They would argue about the American casualties. A few would argue also about the larger humanitarian disaster that was the war. But it was still a matter of indifference, I think, when you look at, for example, the Vietnam War Memorial, in which Vietnamese people are not mentioned. Same true of the Korean War Memorial. The Korean people are not mentioned. And millions uh, in Vietnam died as a result yeah, of Yeah, I fighting. think it was probably about three million. Not only as a result of the U.S. There was another no, 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 no. It was a nasty, nasty civil war. No question about it. And even to this day, I visited Vietnam a few years ago, and people don't like to talk about what happened after the war there because it was such an ugly, repressive, vengeful government that exacted its revenge. So, yes, there's a lot of blame to go around, but we are responsible for a lot of what happened. Would you say the U.S. drove Vietnamese into the ranks of the insurgency because of bombing raids that killed civilians, similar to Afghanistan, as much as ordinary Afghan people despise the Taliban. It was American airstrikes that started to turn public opinion against the United States. Yeah, I think in Vietnam, the countryside, particularly people in the countryside, were already in favor of a change of government. You have to remember that for several years, beginning with French colonialism and then the South Vietnamese government being formed in 1956, they were very corrupt government and people in the countryside recognized that and were already sort of in favor of the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front, maybe foolishly in favor of them, you know, uh, not to say that it was necessarily a good decision, but I think that they were already prone to support their countrymen fighting first the colonial French, the imperialist French, and then the imperialist Americans. So by 1965, 66, when things really heated up for us in Vietnam, you had basically in South Vietnam, you really had them on the side of the National Liberation Front. So U.S. actions, killing, bombing, these horrible sweeps of villages, and they burned down villages. We displaced, forcibly displaced 5 million people, put them in camps, basically. You know, really nasty stuff. That made it worse. It made it worse. And so by the time that Vietnam fell, it was a very, very unpopular government, just ripe for the picking. The Strategic Hamlets program, again, another example of language. Strategic Mm -hmm. Hamlets was putting people behind basically what? Barbed wire, taking them out of their ancestral homes. Here's maybe another factor as to why civilian casualties, as we sit here in 2022 in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, don't really penetrate our mindsets. Did U.S. leadership come to believe it had mastered war after the Gulf War of 1991, which appeared, at least to our eyes, sitting on our living room couches and watching the war on television, to be clean, short, successful, You know, we saw the the videos replayed on the news of a missile hitting a single house. Well, I think that there was a, yes, a a kind of a false confidence that grew from that. It was a war in which still a lot of people died. Uh, Again, very difficult to get a number. It's in the tens of thousands, maybe the low tens of thousands. Which is an astonishing number, although relatively speaking, you mentioned before, millions in previous wars. So it was a very quick war. It was over quickly, although there was an aftermath that was ugly for the Shia in the south. Saddam was able to repress a rebellion that George H.W. Bush encouraged. But uh, yes, relatively speaking, it was a clean war, quote unquote. There were other consequences, and that was a kind of a centrifugal 
a dispersion of power inside Iraq, which became important in the 2003 invasion because Saddam lost control of of a lot of Iraq to these local tribal chieftains. And that, as I was explaining earlier, resulted in, in the insurgency as we came to know it. But yes, a desert storm was a great ego booster for uh, war planners. I think they looked at the 2003 invasion, particularly. And of course, the Afghanistan invasion at first was very quick and very successful. What they didn't understand was that these people in Afghanistan and Iraq, whether or not they were evildoers or just ordinary citizens, they had a long-term interest in their country not being occupied by the United States. We don't seem to appreciate the fact that it's their home turf and they are going to ultimately determine the terms of, of warfare and peace on their home turf. Fighting wars as if there are no negative consequences. It's just mind-boggling. And you know, I hope I don't sound too agitated. Uh, I try not to be. I've been in a state of agitation, though, since I started preparing for this conversation because, and this will be my final point, we Americans do have a lot on our minds right now. There are some legitimate issues to be concerned about. The pandemic, the state of democracy, etc. But what if, instead of 7,000 articles every day about Joe Rogan or Whoopi Goldberg or this or that relatively trivial issue. This was in front of our eyes. Empire precedes disintegration. The endless wars, the era of forever war, eroding the foundations of the American Republic. And it just doesn't seem to, again, penetrate our mindset. That was a very long-winded way of asking you to uh, offer your final thoughts Well, I think that you're right, uh, that we get easily distracted by trivial things. I think that's maybe human nature. But what concerns me is we seem not to learn from these catastrophes. I mean, Iraq was the biggest catastrophe of American foreign policy, perhaps in in the entire history of the republic. Now we're looking at Iran as if this is another place we can go bomb do war with if they don't do our bidding. I have a book coming out soon on a U.S.-Iran relations called Republics of Myth. And part of what we argue, I have two co-authors, part of what we argue is that we simply don't understand the political culture of Iran. They also don't understand us. And this is going to lead to conflict, potentially, if we don't uh, wake up and and see what the consequences of these wars have been. We need to learn something from what happened with Iraq. We need to learn something about Afghanistan, not just focus on the tragedy of the 13 soldiers who were killed at the end of the evacuation or the Afghans that we've left behind, all of which is unfortunate, to say the least. But we have to look at a 20-year history of occupation that didn't result in the outcome that we had planned for Afghanistan and the same with Iraq. If we don't come to grips with this politically, we'll make the same mistake again and perhaps very soon in neighboring Iraq. John Tierman, we thank you. And again, the title of the forthcoming book is Republics of Myth, National Narratives in the U.S.-Iran Conflict. On the next episode of History As It Happens, the war in Yemen. This war has to end. And to underscore our commitment, we're ending all American support for offensive operations in the war in Yemen, including relevant arms sales. Why does the United States still support the Saudis in this humanitarian catastrophe? That's next when we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 